The Rolling for Tlaquor School District. My name is Peter Clavundi, Director of Operations. The uh, mission statement and vision are our usual beginning to remind people why we are here. We would like everybody to respect for each other, act in engagement while we're working, and we will have our leadership in the community, suit of excellence. The facility committee is designed to provide oversight of the district's infrastructure, schools, facilities, and supporting facilities, the athletic fields. Meetings are conducted by central office. Agenda items will be listed below. And after each agenda item, we'll present it. We'll call upon members for questions and answers, followed by committee uh, community members. A reminder that this is a live televised uh, show. We have it on camera. So any conversation will be picked up. And we please keep all comments quiet until you're actually called on. That way we don't betray that out to the public. In addition, there are two sign-in sheets on the back table. If you would please sign in at some point tonight for the facilities committee is on one page and the finance committee, which will follow immediately after, is on the other sheet. The agenda for tonight is a roll call of our committee members, followed by a approval of some minutes, project updates, and we'll have a presentation on athletic study by Mr. Hugh Kudzow. At this time, I'd like to have the roll call. Dr. Rande? Here. Mrs. Fulbert? Here. Mr. Henry? Here. And Mr. Kudis? Here. Our committee members are all here. Thank you. We were also passed out to those four uh, minutes. Uh, I sent those uh, draft minutes from last month's meeting. If everyone had a chance to read them, I have a motion to approve those minutes as presented. Motion to approve. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Thank you. Project updates. First, I'll talk about Kingfield turf replacement. You need it now. The old one's gone. Literally in three days, they removed the synthetic turf. It's completely out of this area except for one dumpster of uh, rolled turf. The next phase will be to come in and excavate the grass and jump zones beyond each end zone, installation of drainage piping and stone, uh, followed by the installation of the new jump zones and runways followed by the installation of the new synthetic turf. All of that work should take place between May 15th, which is the day they started, and August 11th. And they have a time schedule. The next slide will show you that. In addition, while King Field's turf is being replaced, we were talking about additional work in King Stadium recommended for contract award. They're all through CoStar's program, so we did not have to go out and go for bids and advertisements, but we did solicit bids from several companies. We will be replacing the fence and gating around the track. CoStar's vendor, Able Fencing. We will be installing mid-aisle handrails on the visitor side bleachers through Stadium Solutions. And we will have to modify the home bleachers for ADA wheelchair ramp and some pockets on the first level to add wheelchair seating on the main stands higher up off the track so they can see better. And also by Stadium Solutions. We will be purchasing a set of portable bleachers from, uh, it's actually through General Recreation is the vendor for K Park Speedy Bleachers. They are transportable and road worthy. They can be driven around to our other fields for other seasons, be able to use those. And we will be replacing a digital scoreboard with a digital LED scoreboard. Currently, the CoStar's vendor is Casey Signs, a local vendor that has given us a uh, quote to do a digital combination, raise it, and relocate it. Right now, the uh, turf field is under construction. Some of the pictures of the things that are going on, we're trying to keep people out of that area because not this moment, but uh, during the day, there's active construction equipment running around, crossing the track with padded area, but also they bring equipment in and out. And we've had several, you know, Visible vehicle things moving pretty quick in there. I've seen them moving around, and I had to watch as I'm walking out there to inspect it. So, there he looked like he stripped it up. And you can see on the uh, top left, uh, it is a stripped area. And that same area is the area on the right top picture the next day. They pick it up, roll it up, and then they bring it along the machine, it sucks up all the rubber. There's the timeline. This is a time schedule that is very hard to read at this size, but. It is a construction schedule which shows it will be complete by the August 15th date. And this is a depicted area of what it should look like from an aerial view from the home side in the future. We've just got all the color samples in to make sure that they would match and do the 
colors to show that. Other projects we're working on, replacing hot water heaters. We've replaced and finished two schools in the other Providence and Baltimore Rutledge are completed. They're currently working at the high school with an estimated delivery next week of the main hot water heater and storage tank for that unit. So we do think they can get it done at the end of the month, but it'll be close because the unit's currently in shipment. The electronic door sensors is about 85% complete, estimated completion all through the end of May where there are 10 sensors on each door at every exterior door in the district. So we'll know if doors are propped open. We also have the electronic fob reader access doors of the three elementary schools. Physically, the installation is complete, but unfortunately the actual fobs to issue to the teachers are back ordered. They're a long lead item, but we should get those in any day or expected in. We also had a bid uh, advertised for seal coating the Swarthmore Rutledge School parking lots and roadway doing some line striping of any parking spots. Those bids were opened on the 11th of May. The low bidder is AF Damon at 29,550. They have the same company that did the high school last year. They had, it was another bidder, very similar price, but it was since we've already had them and it was $1,000, $2,000 lower. We went with recommend AF Damon. The Trinity roof is complete as of yesterday they uh, finished pulling out of all their equipment except the dumpsters hadn't been pulled out when i looked this morning but the roofing is replaced on all three sections of the building over the daycare over the storage portion and the boiler room the marquee building and directional signs for the district between the middle school and the high school were reviewed at the nether providence township zoning hearing on monday night and all were approved for acceptance there were multiple variances we needed for number of signs, distance uh, and size, but they were all passed with a, a two to one. There's still a 30 day grace period or uh, recommended wait for appeals, but no one seemed to object. There was a couple of concerns about safety, which we will address as we install those. It's about the fencing across the front of the high school that they want. We want to move it for site distance, but we don't want to take it out. We're not going to remove it completely. Mm -hmm. The guaranteed energy savings project, our LED lighting replacements is about 90% complete district wide. And the picture on the left is the hallway in the grand hallway of the high school with the dilapidated old fixtures on the ceilings hanging down. You can see a couple of them. That's the same area, exactly the same light fixture area in the right hand picture. So we've done a much better looking fixture. We're saving energy, but it uh, is coming to fruition that that area is just one of the examples of improving the aesthetics as well as reducing our energy. And I will now turn this presentation over to Mr. Hugh Kudzow. Hugh Kudzow is with our ELA Sport Group. They're the ones that have done our uh, athletic field study. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, what I have here is a basically a summary slide uh, of the of the study. I'm going to go over, kind of hit the hot uh, those hot spots, uh, high points here. And um, I guess you want to you want to hold questions to the end of the first day, or you know? we're going to run through and go to care. Okay, so uh, we teamed up with Hummer Turf, who uh, is, uh, and we're both members of American Sports Builders Association. Hummer is actually a contractor; we're a designer, uh, and so you know we've been uh, started this uh, report. For, uh, project goals: identify the proper number of fields, identify design concerns. Account for equity, Title IX, identify potential safety issues, and establish phase approach to recommendations. So, what we did here, key insights, uh, these are important with all our, basically the whole study going through everything in summary. Uh, many of the current maintenance issues, and there are plenty, are primarily primarily due to the original construction of the facility. That's uh, just over the years, there's just a history of things were built, that's the way they were left, and really have never had any type of major overhaul. And it's kind of been uh this been kind of the status quo. Uh so many we found that many of the issues, maintenance issues are involving the original construction. Um there appears to be a lack of continuous quality maintenance program over the years. There was some impetus to do some some work. Uh and then kind of just for budgetary and staffing purposes, lost uh, lost momentum there. Uh, currently, the the uh, uh, athletic field uh, maintenance budget is actually combined with the general lawn maintenance budget as kind of one overall thing. And lawn maintenance, I think, I, as you see, I think it indicated there is about ninety thousand dollars, while roughly about eighty is been spent uh, on fields. And uh, based on heavy field usage, which I'll show a little bit later, um, 
and these fields do get hammered pretty good. Uh, there should be at least suggested consideration of some type of synthetic turf facility. Uh, the two better locations have their own issues. So to come off and say, this is where you need to put it, I, the, you know, the thing to do is take a look at both situations. And, uh, and, and that, that would involve a whole nother level of investigation. The field investigation, what we did is us at Hummer Turf uh, and staff uh, kind of walked around and took a look at each of the facilities and kind of came up with a bullet item of, uh, of, of, of issues that we saw. And so some of them were just, you know, uh, just observations. But what you see in yellow, uh, and this is kind of a common theme, theme throughout the very first bullet item is access to field is unpaved and non-ADA compliant. That's, that's pretty much a consistent issue um, throughout. Uh, now, when these fields were built, that wasn't an issue, but nowadays as, as things change and when you do any type of field renovations, ADA access is, is one of the tantamount things you try to achieve. So again, these are just observations, this is you know, what, what we see. The limited fencing at the ball field, uh, I think you've had two or three people hurt this year so far with, with balls being hit. Uh, so that illustrates, uh, illustrates that issue. Uh, no dedicated bullpen, uh, diversion ditch, so access is somewhat limited. You can see, I mean, that, where that excavation is to the left is actually where the new storage shed is going to be going. So, but uh, it's already the, there. It's uh, already there. there. Okay. Um, to the right there, that's third baseline. You have the drainage dish there to uh, take get water off the field. That kind of limits access. That's your varsity dugout, quote, quote, uh, right there. You can see the water flows and you can see the unpaved access coming down to the field to the right. The middle school fields. Standing water there. Uh, the grades in these fields, again, no ADA access. Depression separates the field, so it's not one continuous area. Again, the grades on this field, based off the topography that we saw from uh, prior projects, is less than 1%. So it's essentially flat. So the water has nowhere to go. Uh, so it will sit. And then it'll just cut, it, the soil will condense, it, it compact it, and then uh, you know, be difficult to grow grass on it. Lower left is a typical thing you'll see in the gold mouth. You see how compacted all that soil is, is there. Uh, again, well, the fields are flat. The middle school fields, which are King, the King Stadium uh, situation here, I think everyone's quite familiar with. The, uh, the both grandstand stands like proper ADA access. The visitor's grandstand needs mid rails in the aisles, which is one of the projects that are being looked at now. The front walkway, the access around the, the concession stand is unsatisfactory, putting it uh, bluntly. Uh, there's tripping hazards, there's no paving, nothing like that for people to access. Well, you can see where people are walking again by the compacted soils that are there. Um, so uh, looking at some other areas, you can see the walkway in front of the visitors. There's, it's inconsistent. There's only pads at the steps, the mid rails, the visitors, the bottom fissure on the left, that's actually being walked on now. The uh, ponding areas around the grass, you can, that's the shot, that's a shot foot area. You can see the standing water there. And actually to the right, where there's some storage shed there, you can see where the mud is on the paved areas right there. That's a sign of, of ponding. The clumpy grass growth to the right there is also a sign of ponding and settling water, where again, there's some proper drainage. And that's one of the things we cite that needs to be done at the stadium uh, is to uh, better store water. The field hockey lower field, all in all, actually is one of the better fields. Um, but uh, again, no pedestrian access, no vehicle access. Major problem with some of the major fields over there at the high school is there's no real nearby parking areas. Um, you know, you have to you have a heck of a haul to go to the fields uh, fields for usage. Uh, so when it comes to the uh, you know you know the grandparents, um, people have uh, issues getting there. They, this needs to be, that needs to be looked at. Um, and then again, the field condition is fair, but we, we cite in our report too, uh, uh, in our actual, our study that this particular field is one of the better maintained fields. It's field hockey fields are usually, usually require a little higher maintenance. Is that they, due to factors, you know, extenuating circumstances, some care wasn't able to be done on the field and the field got overrun with crabgrass in one season. So that's the whole thing about keeping constant maintenance, you know, give the fields a fighting chance. Uh, to keep going. Uh, also, too, here, you like, you know, you have the slopes, the slopes coming down from the high school kind of drain. There are little ditches in here separating it. This is the practice football field. You can see kind of the clumping pattern uh, in, the uh, in, the, in the grass. It's the scale. You can't really see it, but the bottom picture, you, there's, there's bare, bare spots there. 
Um, again, bare spots around it. The softball uh, backstops, the uh, underuse of the softball field, the backstops are all rusty, falling apart. Um, the lower right, I think the JV softball field, the, the backstop is, you can see it's popping out. And even like down below the infill, it's hard to see and get this picture. The infill is actually coming in over the fence. So uh, it, again, it's just, it's it, there's care to it, but you can do it so much. Um, the Mesa field, uh, this field in our in a usage analysis gets used heavily, which is clearly you can see by that picture in the top there. Uh, that is not a gold mouth area. That is that's the field itself. Um, how it gets compacted, and, you know, kids use use on it, just compacting the grass, compacting the grass, uh, and then it can't grow. And uh, this is what you get. Also, too, with it, uh, again, no ADA access to field. There's a pathway that goes up and stops short. The field is undersized. That's one thing we know, too, going through the different analyses, uh, different fields. Really, there's two fields that pretty much all sports can be played on. Without, when I say played on, I mean by having full, you know, minimum regulatory regulation side of field, the King and Rutgers cages. Most everything else has some type of configuration, some type of limitation on it that. You can play soccer on it, but the field is not going to really be up to standard size. You can play lacrosse on it, but it's going to be kind of cattywampus. Um, some of them are fine, but um, it, it's something that we, we notice this field in particular, because you can see in the lower right, there's basically, there's a hill there that this field, when this lift was built, uh, was graded in there, but it wasn't graded large enough. Um, so you have a very tight, tight area there uh, that you have to deal with in Mesa. Uh, this is uh, Rutgers Katie's. Uh, this uh, no ADA access to the field. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, a lot of older field events that are in there, uh, venues that are there. From a designer standpoint, it's, it's kind of like a little bit of a historical look. See how things were built, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. But that's not a good thing now because they're not being used. They're taking up field space, uh, which could be better used for the kids. The one thing too about this track. Um, uh, the time we were on there every day, every time we were there, that it field is that track is heavily used by the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It is a significant recreational feature. So, you know, we even suggest that we suggest keeping it and maintaining it because that is obviously uh, a key community usage uh, uh, that you have there. The little soccer field that's the left, you, you try to find grass in that picture to the left. I mean, that, that field is heavily used. And the one thing too, when it comes to when it comes to athletic fields, you could you know you could do all the maintenance you want, but all it takes is one rainy day, one rainy Friday, one rainy Saturday, where some coach decides to go out there and practice and play, and everything's for naught. So, um, and we understand the pressures of youth uh, youth sports and stuff. I mean, I had three kids, I coached, I booster club, I everything. I know where it comes from, but. You know, the one thing I will note too is that, you know, people don't, they don't really think about what happens to them because uh, it's more important to play. But yeah, this is obvious, obvious overuse there. Uh, the, uh, the Providence is actually, that was, uh, was uh, renovated, I uh, can't remember off the top of my head a couple of years ago. There is major issue there is no ADA access, no full pads. The grading is a little steep, but it is, it, the grass is a good condition, it's irrigated. Um, so it's it's actually a pretty decent uh, decent field, but there again too, then there's a size limitation on it. Um, but you you only have so much space in in the backyard of the of the school. So I mean it it, it fits tight, but it does serve its purpose. Swarthmore Rutledge is primarily youth sports field, no ADA access, limited act, act, ADA access. It should stay steady because there's a walkway up and there's a trail along the first base side that you can access it through that way. Um, uh, Again, the, the field is is flat in areas uh, where you you know you grass growth is is limited. Uh, Henderson Field, again, you look at the lower right there. You know, heavy usage. You know, the wear and tear, the clumping pattern. Some of that is because this those shots are taken in the winter. Some of that is the actual species of grass, but a lot of those areas you can see are heavily com compacted as well. Um, there's no ADA access there. The left field is too short. It's only two. It's only uh, 240 feet uh, uh, deep. Um, so it's you know if you're yeah, yeah easy home runs there. 
Um, the district has flat, again, like a lot of many of the fields, there's flat slopes, so it doesn't grade well. There's severe drainage issues, flooding issues along the third base side, uh, which uh, Nick, I know, really has been trying to uh, identify and help over the years. Uh, there's, I'll uh, flip to the next page, the road is right along the side there. Um, and so, uh, you know, plow balls that way uh, could prove a safety issue. The the fence you see there that's, uh, you know, is it's six, six foot high, which is a bare minimum. It's rusty, It's it's been knocked knocked, uh, knocked out, so it's kind of falling apart. The lower left picture is where the third baseline, that's kind of where the flooding comes on down, makes that part of the field essentially not usable. So overall con comments, the maintenance program, uh, about five to seven years ago, uh, the Penn State method, which is a whole uh, way of taking care of fields is implemented, but due to staffing shortages and just budgetary constraints, it kind of uh, got one by the wayside and was, you know, with other way, other steps are done. But like I said, I've said already tonight is that you know for a maintenance program to be to be effective, it has to be used consistently. Um, uh, otherwise, it just takes one season for weeds to overtake uh, fields. Field construction um, through research and site visits is apparent that many of the maintenance issues are, are, are due to the original construction of the fields. Again, this is not, you can't point back and say in 1962 they did this field. It's just, it, this is the way it was, and it just over the years is the way it developed. Public school trends, the major issue with many public schools is that if, uh, athletic facility grounds maintenance is often underfunded and understaffed. Uh, the only, of all the school districts, I've worked for over 100 school districts, the only one I've seen in the state that's properly, would they say properly staffs Lower Marion. They have like 20 people on their staff. Lower Marion School District. I mean, so you are not, you are not alone in this. I mean, you know, I've gone to professional CAFMO events, which is at full athletic facilities, and it's the story is the same. With often too with municipal township people, with people who take care of athletic facilities. It's just, you know, and so, and they realize, you know, the amount of usage nowadays, youth sports, things like that, uh, you know, it's, you, you need to look at it as more of an investment into because of the amount of usage that goes on and how important it is uh, to the kids and, 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 and families in the district. Um, field usage, we look at it two different ways. Um, yeah, basically the baseline field use recovery method. Um, Fields could, uh, depending on their construction, can uh, have anywhere between 50 and 100 events a year. It's kind of a rule of thumb based, extrapolated off of different things with sports turf, uh, turf management association statistics and stuff. So your standard high school field, no irrigation, you know, uh, no drainage, 50 events a year. Uh, if you have, you know, sub drainage, mostly you have irrigation. You, you'll have irrigation when you have sub drainage. 75 events a year. And if you're top of the line in ground irrigation, uh, you know, sub drainage, all that, you're talking about 100 events a year. So using those factors, we took a chart and we looked at every, every field. And based off of the amount of public events and school district events, the baseline method, there's 515 more events in the fields technically can handle. Which means if you divide it off the baseline, that you you need eleven more fields to address the needs of both the public and and the, and the uh, school district. Obviously, you don't have uh, fifty acre tract of land sitting vacant somewhere. So you know, but this this method is always kind of the extreme. This it, this is you know it shows okay, this is your worst case. So, you know, taking a look at this chart here, like now with Kingfield being a synthetic turf, arguably they can do a thousand events a year. So whatever, you have 568, you're way under that. But, you know, baseball, JV and soccer, uh, your baseline events are 75, you have 107. Um, middle school soccer, lacrosse, 50 is the baseline, you have 108. Uh, you know, the, the practice football softball field dog leg is 150 of 266. So you can see how much higher you usages are compared to what, you know, a baseline methodology would indicate a field could take. So, you know, that chart illustrates that. Now, another way we look at it is school teams. Basically, you know, you have fall teams, you have spring teams, and there's a method assigning a field per team. And I'll show you the chart, but basically that says about you're about seven fields short. 
uh, based off the needs for the sport teams. And this is, you take each football, there's, there's different levels of football, different levels of field hockey, different levels of boys soccer, different levels of girls soccer, the crosses and the band. And then you have the stadium factor there, and that comes up. You have about you're about seven uh, seven fields, you know, short based off of the usage. Um, and this is what I mentioned before about the different fields and how they compare size wise. So King Field is a two ten by three sixty playing area. All sports can fit in that in that in that footprint. The baseball JV soccer field one sixty five by three thirty. You know, really only a soccer uh, properly, and even that's a minimum size soccer field. That should be like one that minimum 195 wide. The uh, MS Lacks soccer one and two, you're, you're talking 190 by 300. You can play soccer there. Um, and yeah, other sports too, um, but soccer primarily. The lower field one, field hockey and soccer, softball practice, football, you know, soccer. Rutgers Avenue, all sports can be played there. And Henderson Field, you see the sizes there. So they're not all properly sized for all, all sports, or if they are, they're minimum, minimum sizes. Uh, so what we uh, options to address the shortages, you have two things you can do. You can reconstruct renovate existing multi uh, purpose fields and the fields requiring most work or no particular order. The baseball soccer field, uh, middle school lacks fields, soccer fields, Rutgers Avenue, Henderson. Uh, or you can construct a synthetic turf uh, facility that could absorb absorb the events, take the events off off the grass fields. So what we did here, we were asked and we pulled together kind of a comparison chart. These are originally based off of the uh, uh, Sports Turf Management Association chart a couple of years ago. Uh, they kind of did a, uh, a study and, and, and kind of a rule of thumb type look see. And where the biggest thing with synthetic turf is the ins upfront installation cost. You, right now, at one time it was like $13 a square foot, now it's up to 22. Um, you know, and even higher depending on, on, on uh, where you where you are. The cost per square foot of natural grass at one time was, you know, in, you know, pretty much just at maybe nine or so or eight. It's gone up to around thirteen. And so, when you look at your seasonal maintenance cost, again, this is based off the chart for the uh, Sports Turf Management Association, just kind of a standard. You're talking about, you know, again, this is this is prop this is proper care proper care of an athletic field to keep it. Keep it up and operational and, 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 and in good shape, healthy grass growth, et cetera. You're talking, you know, about 7,000 for synthetic per year and about 20,000 per year for natural grass. Uh, per event cost, uh, again, synthetic turf, you get the per event cost when you factor in maintenance and then the annual number of events you can get. Uh, the per event cost uh, is is much cheaper with, with synthetic turf. Again, that's because of the level of amount of maintenance you have to do. So what we what we did here, we took each of the facilities and came came up with a came up with a list of suggested recommended improvements. And I, I don't want to go into each of these specifically, but the one thing with these costs, we also factored in one of the elements that we've noted uh, in the. Uh, in this, the high school field as well as here is a basically there's really no field house uh, or facility for teams to go to get uh, locker rooms out out of the school. Also, um, also speaking as a you know as a long time coach, it's like when that lightning lightning storms come up, you need a place to go. And if you're away in that backfield, there you've got a long way to go. And so it's a safety issue, um, safety issue that you, you need to figure about. So your buildings could be. A simple, simple, you know, building kind of like what was in Henderson, or it could be more of a more of a, a field house where you have, you know, maybe some, um, you know, locker rooms, maintenance, maybe a trainer room or something like that. So the cost you see there actually include those those buildings now, and I'll I'll explain. So when you do like you add them all up, it, it, you're not going to be doing three field houses. You're not going to be you're not going to be doing multiple synthetic turf fields, but so right now we're just looking at that facility as it is, and you can see like you know the uh, the baseball JV soccer field major renovations. So we're talking we're talking grass there and stuff like that, and again factoring that we put in just kind of a as a uh, rule of thumb two point five million for a field house. Well, so you're dealing like five you know five point four. Option two would be you know a synthetic complex. Um, which would be actually a, a little a little bit cheaper uh, cheaper than um, uh, uh, but not by much. 
Uh, again, then um, in, um, the, the soccer fields would be major renovations, major reconstruction, King Field, everything we have there, everything we have there right now is aside from what's being done currently. Uh, and actually, if if the, that field was still the way it was with those dirt, uh, what we call D areas, one of our recommendations would have been to, to do what's being done now because from a maintenance perspective, uh, that's a problem also from a safety perspective too. It's better to have, you know, continuous surface. Uh, and again, going down some, some field hockey field is probably one of the least expensive up, uh, upgrades that are be, will be needed. Uh, the practice football field, again, we have the grass renovation and we have, have the synthetic turf, item uh, seven, item eight, Mesa, uh, what do you require a significant overhaul, tennis courts right now. Um, the one thing too with tennis courts, uh, ideally you'd have eight courts, a, a battery of eight, uh, and locating an additional two courts, um, there's no easy place to put it. Um, and so uh, that's kind of one thing we kind of put to the side because uh, you have to take over parking lot areas and stuff like that, and that's usually a no-go. Um, well, we've never seen anyone willing to give up a parking lot to test for. Um, Rutgers Avenue Fields, uh, again, you know, that thing has a, that, that field is actually was originally built, uh, you know, as, as a, you know, was there a long time as an as a, uh, athletic field. That, that could be reconstructed. And uh, NPE, again, there's a cost there. Henderson Field, you know, that's, you know, we actually, the biggest nut there is actually the team rooms. Um, and the, the remedial work on the third baseline drainage is uh, my understanding of the borough is supposed to be doing that. So the cost above include items for field house, bathroom, concession facilities, the middle school, high school, and Henderson Field totally 7.5. When removing that, just looking at athletic fields, the range is between 6.5 and 10.5. Uh, for just solely site renovations. Um, the, uh, and remember too, this is just a base plan. This, this, is a, this, this won't get implemented overnight. You have to, you're looking at a minimum, minimum 10 years. Um, and right now too, if you would consider doing a synthetic turf field, consider that you're installing one now, you don't want to install something close on the, on the schedule because That'll be in there for about 10, 12 years. You want to kind of have this one like do every fifth or sixth year comparatively. So that way you can kind of stretch your maintenance, maintenance dollars out over time. Uh, immediate implementation, we suggest uh, getting a uh, provider budgeting uh, for maintenance program district wide, uh, create something that um, could be basically on call, you know, what you need for it. Um, you know, and have its own separate, uh, separate because there's so much that needs to be done with these fields. Uh, it's it really, in my opinion, more some type of separate budget that you can you can you know track and focus on. Phase one, the additional uh, uh, shortage, uh, address the shortage of the multi-purpose fields. Some type of new synthetic turf field um, is is suggested either at the high school or middle school site. Uh, Remedial phase two, remedial work at the King's King's Field, which would be like the concession stand and all those areas, the walk place, and things like that, the stormwater, uh, everything along those lines. Phase three, uh, address the remedial work at the varsity ball fields. Uh, is for now, um, you know, and again, it, it's, these could be, could be done whatever way you want to do them, but this is just this is kind of an a la carte. This is what we throw them out here as you know as as a uh, grouping. Phase four, address the remedial work on the multi-purpose fields, primarily used by the district. Phase five would be to uh, uh, this, uh, the youth sport field uh, to work, work on that. And that is 175 pages compressed down into whatever I, I So, um, but in summary, I mean, there's a lot and you, you all recognize there was a problem, and we did find them. Um, they're not insurmountable. Um, you know, you're not alone. Um, but in your case, in the district space here too, there's there's just a lot of facilities that have the same issue of being needing to be reconstructed um, right now. And that's you know that's that's the one major one thing the other districts you may have you know you have the crown field you have a good drainage just worn down you need to maintain it some of these facilities will have to be reconstructed in order to be on a good chance of survival um 
but uh, it's heavily used, which is, I mean, I know that when I first met with Pete and Nick and, and, and Dr. Nassay, there's a lot of youth leads around here. There's a lot and everybody wants to use them and it's, that's great, but when you use a draft field, it takes a beating and you end up with divots and humps and, you know, and then you have a safety concern with people, and, you know. So one person's bloody practice is another person who broke an ankle. I mean, that's what you have to watch out for. So um, I'll shut up. Um, so. Mr. Grande, there's a certain comment, question. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make a few comments before we open things up to the committee and then the board. Um, one is I think that the comment you made is important that some may see this as a plan that somehow is here for immediate implementation. And I think we want to be clear that the reason the board requested this work is that as a district, we need to engage in long range planning. And this is part of long range planning. So I think that what we have here is a very helpful assessment of the current state of conditions. A number of recommendations about what we could do to try to get our fields upgraded. Um, they have been neglected for a very long time, and I don't think it's appropriate for the district to manage its facilities on a year to year basis and just deal with whatever is the most immediate pressing crisis of the moment. Uh, but we do need a longer time horizon to think about both investments as well as upkeep and i think this is an important step uh, in that process i think that we want to try to get to a place where we're not managing things just as they break or managing things just as they become unusable and i think that uh has been the case a little bit in recent years and so that is the overall objective here is to try to get us in a better long-term place i also want to say that I view a plan like this as, again, it has a long time horizon, but also as a plan that I think we need to think as a community, um, how we partner uh, potentially capital campaigns to fund some of this work, partnerships with some of our recreational organizations who are heavy users of our fields to figure out how can we partner and do some of this work together, take care of our fields together, uh, and give our uh, give our students and all the kids in the community a uh, reasonable, uh, not elite, but a, a reasonable place uh, to engage in both recreational sports as well as uh, competitive um, uh, high school and middle school sports. So I think that's important to say, um, because I think some may look at this report and say, my God, this is a lot of money. And uh, how are we going to do that? And I think the answer is, well, we're not going to do that <laughs> right away. Again, we're going to look with a longer time horizon. Um, the only thing I want to say before we I open things up is, um, you know, I'm trying to be cognizant of these meetings that we we sandwich a facilities committee meeting and a finance committee meeting uh, together uh, on these occasions. And I know from the perspective of the public, it's useful if we can try to run our meetings in a way that those who are tuned in watching can easily follow along. So making sure again people introduce themselves um, and also run the meeting efficiently so that you know people aren't trying to tune in until you know late in the evening and, and sort of lose lose steam by the time we get to the later parts of, of this meeting. So when it comes time for public comment, what I'll ask is when we move to the public, if people could try to make their comments, uh, if you have questions in a reasonably brief fashion. And we'll let everybody who has comments or questions from the public go one by one. And then when we're all done with that, if there's comments that the administration wants to make in response or guests this evening, uh, we can do that and try to try to uh, synthesize those uh, elements together. So with that, let me turn to the committee, uh, Rachel. Uh, thank you so much for this. This was um, really, really interesting. Um, I, let's see, I also wanted to, um, go on what David said, and, and I was thinking about this definitely as a of the kind of a first step, and it it has to be integrated with our other reports on you know our our elementary school space and our high school space, and this is you know part of in our strategic planning to figure out for you know long term planning and, and to answer a number of questions that that we have to answer. Um, 
So uh, let's see, I mean, I have a whole bunch of questions, but um, so a quick question about the multi-purpose fields that you suggested mm -hmm. one or the other in, you know, one of the other places. Is this is I truly don't know this. Are you suggesting that they, like the second, if there was a second multi-purpose field, say behind King, would that take care of baseball and soccer, like that kind of area? Yeah, that, yeah. Well, actually, well, it's actually up there right now. I mean, that would that area over there would be would be a potential area. And mm -hmm. and but the main problem the main problem with that is is you know you have you have a parking lot up there, but that mm -hmm. won't be enough to support it, and that's the mm -hmm. problem there. On the high school, you know, which basically would be the dog leg and, mm -hmm. and that area there. I had mentioned, I had mentioned Pete, Pete and Nick about, well, you can do the, the football, softball fields there, but you got to get a parking area mm -hmm. down in Dogleg. You can't have people walking this distance. Mm -hmm. I guess kind of a study, <coughs> study done, done, done at the high school, that's exactly what they chose the parking area. Mm -hmm. So both of them have their issues. Yeah. It's not like, do it. You know, you really need to look at it. Right. And the, the, the next step would be, okay, to actually, in, you know, we've done this too, where we'll do this overall study. And it's all right, next step, let's take a look, just a feasibility study. What do you have to do here? What do you have to do there? And then you're like, oh, well, I, you get more realistic costs. And it's like, well, okay, between the two, this is the better option. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's 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 that, that's the issue with, with your available area. So, it's not easily accepted. So, and then the, just to follow up, so the one behind, if we did the one behind King, it would it would be a multi-use field for baseball and soccer. Mm -hmm. It would take care of what is already on those fields. The other, if we did it on the other side on by the high school, that would uh, theoretically be used for softball, like the things that are already. Yeah, there. I mean, and you could. That's and, what and the multi-sport would be. Yeah, and be just multiple football and lacrosse. It's, it's yeah, and that seems to be the thing nowadays. Where there's a lot. I mean, if you're going to put money out for a synthetic turf, you put it out to support all schools. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't, I mean, I you know, I coach spring sports, and uh, I hate to practice in the parking lot. So, <laughs> if you did put pretty much the first month of March, so you want base, you know, baseball may like. Oh, we're going to play natural grass, but we want the turf to be able to practice. So you have to make, you know, trying to dimension it that, you know, they can practice. So now we're going, well, you know, they want yeah, to have everything in this turf. Hard to imagine doing um, base, baseball and mm, yeah. baseball and artificial turf, but I, you know, I'm, I'm old school too, so I agree. But I mean, it seems, again, because of the whole situation, it's, it's a spring sport. Yeah. And up, in, up here, if you're down south, it's not an issue, but up here, it's just spring sports are just the only thing really to track that, that can be really because you know, and even then, the throwing, you know, they're dealing with mud and everything else. And it's, you know, ball's not a problem, it's too hot. Okay. And then just a, another one more quick question. Um, I also would love to, to see, like, perhaps in the future, when we think more about this, um, what do we do about field sizing? You know, if we're, there are some of those fields that are just hemmed in. Okay. You know, what do we, we have to think about how, how do we deal with that? You know, and, and I just, I have, I don't really know. Um, and so I had a quick question about your cost groups that go through. Yep. Okay. I'm done. I will come back. Okay. okay. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Sorry. Two quick, quick questions actually on the, uh, the multi-purpose field. You know, I, I just want to get, try to get uh, a clarification. You were, depending on what methodology you use, you said we can either you need 11 fields or seven fields. We, we know our district, we don't have room for any of that. <laughs> so my, my question is, if because if, if, I'm assuming that this phasing of recommended work is sort of like your idea of like what's prior, what should be done in a priority order, sort of, it doesn't have to be yeah, exactly, right. but that's what I'm trying to get my head around. Yeah, 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 it is. So my question around was that, you, you, would a new synthetic turf field help with if, let's say we don't have space, obviously we do not have space for seven additional fields. If you have a new synthetic field that you can practice on and play on it, that then it reduces the usage of our other fields, right? And does that reduce that down to, you know, it reduces it down. I mean, it depends on the number of fields, other fields you have, but right? yeah. that will take the burden off, off of some of the other fields. Okay. It's, it, it, you know, it, ideally you want lighting, you know, if you can get it. That right. way that optimizes. That optimizes it, and that adds, you know, depending on the configuration of the facility, 
your lighting costs will vary, but it, it's yeah, and that's the whole point of it. It takes it takes those away. Um, so the pressure one. Okay. I like the pressure. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There's no question. Rachel. Yeah. Um, to pick up on Rachel's question about the multi-use fields. Were you, um, again, I know you haven't taken that next step if you want to go there, but I'm just trying to kind of come up with some some conceptual images of my in my mind of what this looks like. So are you suggesting, like if you were to take the high school area or that one we're looking at right there mm -hmm. on the, the varsity baseball field, are you suggesting in, in the ballpark estimates that are on here, a basically full-size soccer field, or are you suggesting, and using that as multi-use, or are you suggesting like in the, over at the high school where it's sort of an odd configuration, are you suggesting something other than a rectangle? No, it'd be, yeah. Okay. I mean, the high school, you can do, you can do a rectangle. Here, you know, ideally the whole back space would be used in order to maximize it. But again, it's- So here you were suggesting going out and left. Yeah, I mean, you know, the baseball orientation could be different, you know, um, and yeah, you could, there's, again, a, a couple different ways. You could sit there and skin this cat in many ways, but you really don't want to lay it out. Um, and then you have to be, also have to be cognizant about Title IX issues and things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's like some people do not want to play on turf field. Ball, I'm talking about ball school, softball. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so for the high school side, what you were envisioning is um, if there's the um, basically the three softball fields, there's the practice football field that goes this way, and I guess they run it this way too. Mm -hmm. You were envisioning like something rectangular over there, yeah, not, not totally going. rectangular, so yeah, okay, yeah, I mean. Again, looking at the size, and, and you know, those numbers are figured off basing off the basic square footage we are looking at and coming up with the policy on that. That's twenty two dollars per square footage. That also like thanks yeah. on storm water. You know, that's not just the perk. I mean, that's everything associated with it. So, um, yeah. the um, find it there. The Ballpark estimates that you, you know, if you're allowed to call them ballpark estimates. <laughs> but, um, that's an industry term. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're in a ballpark. I don't know if it's not a ballpark of a ballpark. But, um, anyway, the, uh, shoot, I can't find that page. The, they see it two options for like that baseball field right there. And mm -hmm. option one was, or option one was natural grass. Option two was, uh, synthetic per multi use facility. Dr. Found it. Yeah, that is. Oh, uh, no, it's still, it's the yeah. slide 30, like 33. Be, uh... Yeah, it's 5.4 versus. The, the yeah. yeah. So just walk me through those two again because they end up coming in pretty similar. They, yeah, okay. There's elements in option one that are not included in option two. Right. Like option, option two, option two. Uh, we do not have the, the field house is not included. Got it. Okay. okay. So, um, so if you take the two point five on here, then you're down to kind of mathematically speaking, you know, the decimal figure. Yeah. Um, my daughter didn't appreciate that. So, yeah, it's about three. Then you're dealing with four nine. So, you know, if you take take that the building. Um, so, in a lot of, I mean, you're dealing because those elements you see there that are under. Uh, the dugouts, uh, the fences, the paved there, that's all part of the synthetic turf. That's in there. I mean, the only thing they're not doing there would be the key when these bathrooms. And they make and they make field the show. Okay. That's going to be cheaper. Okay. Yeah. I just a sort of thinking about this too. When we really get down into things here, we're going to have to factor in names. To this. I mean, that's not in here. This is, these are actual, you know, uh, field work and buildings and things like yeah, that. These it's are not human construction costs. Yeah. And we really, really, if we're serious, we're going to need to factor that in over the long haul. I mean, I do think it would be interesting to see, you know, kind of what is that 10 year total cost of a, 
synthetic truck versus simple, you know, like that, but with maintenance, you know. Yeah, and I, I had, and that's why we provided the, the seasonal maintenance cost. Of I know. Idea. I mean, I just, I'd have to, I have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, you know, I mean, that, that's a, that's a perfect one. But, yeah, I get it. Yes. Yeah. Um, but even beyond that, you know, just make, <laughs> if we, if we're going to do something, I really want us to factor in. Yeah. And the, the, the biggest thing too with um, with synthetic is you have the replacement, which you're all very familiar with now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that that comes in comes into play. You don't have that with your standard natural grass field, but like if you have a top of the line field, you should consider resodding parts of the field every five years or so. Mm -hmm. And no one really does that, and then you end up having to reconstruct. You know if you don't do that, so you yeah. Right. So um, one of the one of the other compelling reasons to do this study right now was to make sure that if we're moving forward with some upgrades, that they don't somehow contradict some larger plan or direction that we might go and have to undo upgrades that we've submitted. And so one of the questions, the um, the baseball field, I know that there's some safety concerns and there's some other issues that I know have been discussed about upgrades to the baseball field. So the idea of fencing, dugouts, those kinds of things, I guess the same question would relate to the softball as well. Any of those upgrades at odds in some way with other, other like some of what is proposed here in other words like if some like safety fencing dugouts those kinds of things were addressed will those somehow be um if you decide that if you think it, you think this is an interim step then go to yeah we make just design, design. if we did design for a for a synthetic turf field would anything that we put in well, yeah, create a problem like dugouts yeah like that um, but if, if, if right now the current issue, obviously, well, what's going on is the safety concerns. Yeah. Um, and instead of putting fencing, you can also install ball barrier netting, you know, sleeve, which can be used anyway. And, and, and say, all right, put that in. I mean, right now you kind of have the, the cross netting up at the netting thing. Um, but you can do that, and that could be reused. I mean, you can use it, you know, say you have 100 foot of yeah. 15 foot ball barrier netting here at the baseball field. Then you know you could use it somewhere else. You know, uh, just this fleet is fleet that, um, and you can use that. Uh, I wouldn't just uh, depending on your like the kind of fence. I mean, although I will say nowadays because of the cost of fence, and we have often reused fence, you know, or sleeved over it. You know, um, so, so but it's but there's yeah. no fundamental like big reconfiguration that you would. And no. I mean, I would, I would, if you, if the eventual goal is to like, right, we're going to have the next, we're going to have to, we're going to eventually do some factory field, but what can we do now? Uh, you know, safety is a positive. You know, you want to, you want to address that. I mean, you're not going to be in the field needs major reconstruction. Doing anything to the field, there's no, there's no little band aid for the outfit. That field is, yeah. Yeah. so. Okay, uh, let me see if other board members have uh, yeah. any questions or comments. Um, thank you. Um, I two things briefly. Um, the ADL ABA compliance that seems to should be a priority, I would think. And is there what like, <laughs> in the township you can get grants? For for putting in ABA, um, is that something possible through a school district to grant? There are, and I I can't I am not that familiar with school district grants and what what's available out there. Speaking as an executive director of a nonprofit, I know there's a lot of grants out there. <laughs> you just gotta find them. Um, and and uh, yeah, there's definitely that. I mean, part. This is required if you go to do any type of major renovation on a facility, you know, or, or like even like this grand sand, build a new field, you have to have ADA access. If there's a lot of stuff's grandfathered, 
in um, with athletic fields. But nowadays, it's really, it's, it's just good practice to have that access. Um, you know, it's not necessarily required, but it's just good practice to have it. Okay. And the other question is, are you talking about making the baseball field synthetic? It's a possibility. But there's nowhere where people are playing baseball on sets. We're doing a lot of synthetic baseball fields. A lot, which, yeah, which I, yeah, you know, Villanova plays a lot actually up where I, you know, they, that, theirs is a synthetic. A couple school districts around here, we've just done synthetic ball fields in the Chamonix, Perky in the Valley, Plymouth White Marsh. Um, yeah, I'm old school. I'd rather have dirt and dirt and grass, but I mean, yeah. Again, it's it's because it's because of the it's a school it's a sport. And I'm wondering in the study why, um, well, Rachel touched on it. Why maintenance isn't isn't Budgeted in, in well, I, I have it as a line item. I have it as a line item, and that could that could in the report um, as you know, this is what you should consider per year. That's how we use that to develop the maintenance. And that's maintenance on turf and and grass and grass. Yeah, twenty thousand. <laughs> yeah, we have those I mean, you know, if you want these added, you know, if we want to add these to the key recommendations. That's definitely doable. But we have them in the report. Okay. So, well, there's, there's no, the 20th no, no, no. right, right there. Yeah. I know, but not the other. So, yeah. Hendrickson. Oh, 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 oh. Well, that's the 20th. Yeah. Well, that because that actually goes to the line we talk about. Uh, I think it's what is it, 20th tour? What is it, 200,000? Or didn't we have a line added in there that you should consider? Because right now, all these all, all that's in the budget is leading, it should be at least double. Is our recommendation. Uh, we, we, yeah, we actually do say that. And it, it's, yeah, right now, and lawn care includes like, that's, it includes lawn plowing lawn. and stuff. And, and lawn care does care, take care of our uh, schools, all my schools, stuff like that. Mulching the beds, some of that. Yeah. That's so about 90,000 we're spending on that on contract and employee cutting the grass, where we do some fertilizing, seeding, aerating with contractors. And we go to a local supply house to get the equipment that we do and use the materials and supply. We spend about eighty thousand dollars a year on athletic fields and about ninety thousand on our perimeter of all five schools, grass cutting, mulching them. But it's not a specific line item. It's strictly for athletic fields. It's part. It's law and services. Yeah, law and services is all folded into them. All right, Kelly. All right, Jen. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let me open things up to members of the public. As I said, we'll walk through. Um, you can make your questions or comments, and then we'll go one by one. Um, yeah. Just remember to introduce yourself and state the street that you live on. So, um, we'll start over here. Yeah. Hey, my name is Mike Mayer. Um, I happen to be the webmaster and owner of HavenFootball.net, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, so. Believe it or not, we've been doing this since 2002 when we started. Never taken a dollar from the school district, never wanted to. It was always, a, as a matter of fact, my, my wife had said, that, you know, I'm not going to see you three months out of the year. Somebody else paid for it. I laid out the money the first year. In any event, we started broadcasting in 2006 on the internet audio. And at our inaugural year in video broadcasting last year, but what we've seen and what's never been addressed with all these millions upon millions of dollars we've spent in the last 20 years, when I say we collectively as a taxpayer, obviously, um, is the press box, which has grown to be, it was put up, I think, in the early 80s by parents. And kudos to them. It is, I don't know that I want to spend a nuclear attack in there, but it's well built. <laughs> it is all wood. And we've had some bug infestation, and in, uh, but the only money we spent on that box, to my knowledge, is a little bit of resealing on the outside walls because there's nothing finished on the inside, and some termite treatment or something that they got in there. There's some kind of wood eating bug, uh, 
But what's changed for all of us is, first of all, that has to be next to the stack bar, the busiest 40 square feet in, in, in the school when there's a game. There's no air conditioning. There's no heat. And to make matters worse, when we begin the season in August, when it's brutal up there, because there's no flow through of air, no fans, although we bring fans ourselves, um, the, the the situation with all the people in there, and we have an electric box up there, I think for the lights, which kicks out heat, which is a beautiful thing to behold when you're driving. Yeah, your ears are sweating in the, in the headsets. But anyway, I really would like you guys, and it's almost trivial compared to the numbers you're talking about, but it's still money that's to spend. I did look into it because I was thinking if I could get a price, I might try to raise the money independently. But I was thinking naively that we could do something for about $30,000, $35,000. Well, forget that. But I did literally get a quote, and I think the quote was for a facility to replace that. And we pretty much the same thing, two stories. We added a, a, a deck on top, which would give us a third story, technically. It wouldn't be enclosed, but there'd be a cover over it. And I think it came in at like $100,000 to get, you know, to build it. And then we'd have to have a crane to put it up and all the wiring and all the other stuff. So, you know, we, I don't know. $150,000. But the other problem is the amount of use it is getting relative to opposing teams. We have no visitors' press box. And, you know, when that thing was built, who would ever put a visitors' press box in high school? But today, there's a lot of, we go to every game. And it's a problem for these schools. And they're building new press facilities because they need to add space. But many times our coaches give up their little coaching space so that we can broadcast the game and they'll go on the roof and they'll do it. But we literally have nowhere to send our visiting teams. They have their own camera equipment for game films. They have their own broadcasting crews occasionally. They use wireless microphones to communicate with their coaches. They use the uh, coach spotters. I mean, and it's way too small. If you put two sets of coaches in that, it would be a disaster in short order. So my plea is I've watched all these wonderful things happen. This is our second artificial field we're putting in now. We put in new lights. We've got a new sound system. You know, all and I keep waiting for somebody to say, uh, well, it's time to take a look at the press box. So I'm saying it. It's really time to do that. And the sooner the better. And and my suggestion, first of all, if you make a committee and you want to as a resident, I'm a volunteer to sit. Um, but I really think the better part of both is probably to put a small press box with power on the visitor side, mm -hmm. and that'll be a coach area and let them have their camera there and, and they'll have their own privacy and their own deal, which is what more and more schools are going to. And I think the simple thing for our press box to keep the footprint is to just probably rebuild the two-story facility we have remove the electrical component to an outside unit on the ground or if that's possible and to build a, a, a roof deck that's accessible so that cameras and stuff again with an awning or something over it uh, there's not being closed but something where we can kind of move a lot of electronic equipment up and away and give our guys some room but if you you know this football season come and take a look you can't get in that press box when we're all fully staffed you know, well, yeah. I, we actually have it in the line item. Oh, do you? Yes, yeah, three hundred thousand. Um, Sorry, I'm going to let them. Yeah, go through. Well, I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so that, that's my. I, I I understand this is what you guys are talking about is a lot of money, but you know if we look at our own lawns and what we spend to grow the grass, cut the grass, make sure it looks good, and then you multiply it by how many acreage, and nobody walks on my grass. I mean, other than a dog you take. So if they try to play baseball or something on my grass, I'd be spending a lot more money to try to keep it going. So it, it's an expensive proposition, but it, as they say, it is what it is. Thank you. You know I recognize your voice. As soon as you started speaking, I was like, that's really familiar. If you'd like my autograph afterwards, I'll yeah. <laughs> I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Leo Carey. I live at 209 Sykes Lane. I just have a couple questions of Pete. Um, or maybe, maybe let me back up. Actually, uh, when you put up phase one, I mean, many of the things, some of the things are already in process based on what Pete has said. Is that a fair, fair thing yeah. to say? Yeah, the replacement of the uh, purchase curve, um, the ADA compliance over there at King Field. 
So I understood it correctly that we've really done that with an and what invest what is the price of that? Pete, you put that up in your slide what the price of all that is. So I just want to say, you know, it's started, it's happening, if I understand it correctly. Correct? You can just go ahead and make your comments and then afterwards if you have questions. Well, all right. Well then uh, I also have a question, Pete. Pete, it's my understanding that some of the synthetic turf that's being removed. It's going to be repurposed, like in the bullpen and the batting cage. Oh, good. That's that's worth noting that it's got, so that's going to happen. Can that be applied? I heard you say other areas wanted a bullpen or wanted something. I'm wondering if if that could happen. We'll answer it. Yeah, just go ahead and let's fire everybody. Did I hear you correctly? Kingfield, the useful life of that purpose, for all purposes, ten to twelve years. Just we'll write them down. Keep going. <laughs> oh, you're not going to answer. You're just going well. To I just I want to give everyone a chance to ask their questions. Yeah, yeah, and then we'll oh, give the administration. Yeah. Okay. Right. 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 Yes, please. <clears throat> Dave, sir, for um, more explaining and monitor. Um, I guess I have, and you might have answered this question already. Um, if I guess my one question is, if all the fields were appropriately constructed, what would be of the annual and remain grass, I'll say that condition, what would we typically have for an annual budget? That was my one question, based on the number of fields we use for that. And then my second question was, what would be the Curb field cost to dome each and every one of the playing surfaces, not 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 the other things associated with those those fields like walkways and things like that. So if we had the the flat playing surfaces that we know don't train well, what would be the typical cost per playing surface to dome it? You know, create the drainage that you need, and and then uh, we sod it or, or or do the grass. Thank you. Because I I guess I'm what I'm trying to do is get an, an idea of based on the number of fields we have. If we were to in one year, we're gonna redo every field. What what is it gonna cost the school district that first year to redo them? So. We have drainage, so we have a fighting chance to at least make sure the fields are safe enough for our kids so we're not getting hurt. And they're a little easier to maintain and grow grass and do those things that we're fighting against. Because, okay. Thank you. Well, are you entertaining comment only on this particular project or is it public comment to for facility? For yeah. anything the facilities is doing right now or just the project? No, I mean, generally the public comment is about things that are on the agenda. So all the projects that we talked about earlier, but if you wanted to make a quick comment about something that may be on a, a future committee agenda, that's fine. Yeah, I do that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is Allison Manneker. I live at 211 College Avenue in Baltimore. And I know it's not on today's agenda, but it has become um, very present in Swarthmore residents uh, attention span about the projected SRS renovation. And again, I know this doesn't have to be a very good presentation about the field, but um, particularly if I listen to how you want to maintain and pay particular attention to the usefulness and the aesthetics of the field, I just want the committee to know that SRS in general and something that's called the Swarthmore Borough Residence Group, which has been mobilized against the PICO, the project, projected PICO tree chop, as well as the neighborhoods surrounding SRS, particularly College Avenue, are mobilized in particular and strongly opposes any change or demolition to the green space in front of SRS. Um, there are, as you know, giant mature trees which again are in the crosshairs of the PICO proposal and there is litigation and mediation going on currently to protect the trees in Swarthmore. It would be unbelievable if the district then proposed in any way touching those trees. It would be 
it, there would be such opposition because this is being opposed throughout the Swarthmore and those trees are not slated for Pico Traw. If the school district were to do that, it, it would be unbelievable. Secondly, as you well know, there's a memorial garden there for people, for the butterfly garden for a teacher who is still very well known by students in this district. Any touching of that garden would be anathema. There are garden beds that are currently being maintained by students, faculty, and alumni. And also, I'd like to point out that the use of that greenscape is not just a shady, sustainable, environmentally sound area, but is an incredible point of connection between the parents at pickup and the students at pickup who are running around enjoying the green space, letting off steam. If you've ever stood there for more than three minutes, it is a joy to behold. And if you were to take that away and pave it, again, the residents and the town generally would be strongly opposed. Um, Swarthmore is aware of this, these proposals about paving it over and they're watching carefully. This is not gonna happen without strong opposition. And although it's cliche to quote Jenny Mitchell, any paving over paradise is going, you, you will unleash an incredible response. So I just, I say that although it's not on today's agenda, but it has now become point one and priority one of Swarthmore to watch what's going on here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, invite administration uh, if you want to make any comments or uh, based on some of the questions or comments that have been raised. I will just mention quickly maybe about SRS. So, I think with the SRS, very familiar with the space in front of SRS. I think that the when the architect came forward with different, so I, I'll say that all that's happening right now is that the architects are looking at options in terms of where we can create more space. And I think the question they raised around if we create more, more classroom space at SRS was whether the borough would require us to have more parking. Um, and so that's what led to them to say, well, if the borough required you to have more parking, where could it go? Um, and so that was the nature of that conversation. So, um, but let me invite um, administration or I guess. A couple of questions were about the dollars and recycling. Um, the Kingfield recycling, all of the rubber infill was removed and staved off to the side had to be filtered out and put back in. So there's recycling there. The uh, Some of the turf was stripped off, was saved to the side for the bullpen and uh, batting cages. The one that we have right there at Kingfield, also one that's going to be constructed over at NPE. So we did save a couple of those uh, mm -hmm. off of the turf before it got out of here. And there was another question about the length of the field usage. Uh, what's the lifespan? Of the yeah, 10, 10, 10, to 12, uh, 10 to 12. Sometimes a little bit longer, depending on maintenance. But yeah, 10 to 12 is a good thing. Or any field. For any synthetic turf field, that's kind yeah. of maybe. Yeah. The warranties are about eight years, but they've had, this one lasted 10 with the amount of usage we've had. It all depends on what you how you use it and how you maintain it. Yeah, the question on the press box, that number was actually similar to a project that has, that's a, it, when you do two story, you have to watch your square footage because if you get over a certain amount, you have to trip in the ADA access, which means an elevator. Right. So with that, that number there is actually, uh, was recently on a project where it has, it's a new modular uh, press box with a film deck up top. Um, so that's, that is in there. The visitor's press box, um, well, there's the space there is pretty tight because that's the access to the baseball. Even the one they built, if I can comment, even when they built, they had to come in and put steel poses. It's not part of the stands. They really it's set it off the stand. Yeah. Um, there was, um, I'm sorry, there were two other questions. Yeah. The two other questions were um, if the fields were appropriately constructed, uh, what would be the annual budget to maintain those fields? Approximately twenty thousand per field. Yeah, and if someone if the field's not irrigated, if you look at the breakdown, the field's not irrigated, then that's not. Then you take that out from that particular field. So it's it's a we have a line by line item down there for each of it. So if the field's not it doesn't have irrigation, you take that out and you can say right, there will be an next next step. Well, the other question is um, with respect to the field being flat. If you were to 
drone those fields correctly to allow proper drainage. Um, what is the per field cost? Um, when you said dome, I was thinking, I was thinking, we were crowning to our dome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have the major reconstruction, I which we have down here, uh. For like major innovations for like the middle schools, three hundred thirty thousand dollars for you know for that field. That's um, field for one field. Yeah, um, you know, and it varies depending on the amount of area you need to go. So you're talking, you're talking at least you know quarter million dollars, uh, depending on uh, on the the area you have to rebuild. Like the, the the baseball soccer field, that's a massive. That whole area is, is needs to need to be big. All right. Well, can I ask one? All right. And then I do want to move on. How many fields do we have? So 300,000 times. About 11. Yeah, 11. There you go. So, well, some of them are smaller. I mean, Henderson's smaller than you have with the high school for the practice field. But in the average, slightly undersized field, we have about 11 fields all over the district. Counting Cades, counting Henderson, and the well, with that, Mr. Kudzel, I want to thank you for this. I think there's a lot of uh, further questions and discussion that will come. I think that we have some uh, digesting of this information to try to think through um, sort of what our, our next questions are strategically about making plans. And then just yeah. for the sake of the public, I'll mention that next month we'll be talking about High school and facilities, and hearing from architects on the education study. So, at the end of the day, all of these pieces the elementary school, the high school, and um, these types of projects all have to come together for a long and um, help. So, um, oh, is your presentation out online? That's a great presentation, yeah. by the way, but I'd love to see it more. Uh, if, if, if it's not yet, it will be tomorrow morning. No, it is on my day. It is there was on board dogs as of yes, as, as of board dogs. Right. Yes. We will adjourn the facilities convening and have a yeah. five minute transition. Yeah.
call uh, the May 17th uh, finance committee meeting uh, to uh, to order. Um, at this time, I would like to um, uh, walk through our mission vision, which we talked about earlier, um, our um, committee uh, protocols moving forward. I would like at this time to take a uh, roll call. I'll start with uh, Dr. Grande. Here. Ms. Holbert. Here. Uh, Mr. Henry. Yep. And Mr. Tudor. Here. Um, thank you very much. At this time, I'd like um, the committee to um, take a look at and approve the 419 Finance Committee meeting minutes. Can I get a motion to approve those uh, those minutes? Motion to approve. And a second on this. Second. Thank you. Um, we will approve the minutes of the 419 Finance meeting. Um, I'd like to um, begin the conversation with, we're going to give you a brief update on where we are with the business um uh, office and then we will uh talk to and mr um king will provide um where we are with regards to the proposed uh final uh budget so i wanted to provide some additional information with regards to we talked about this last month where we are with the vacancies in the business manager position we continue to um let every zone to find uh, candidates. I shared with you last month that it is extremely complex and challenging as um, A, the number of individuals in the industry has shrunk significantly. B, um, there is fierce competition for individuals um, who are there. And it requires, um, though I don't like fishing in other individuals' ponds, that I'm trying to recruit and um, retain someone and say this is where you want to be um uh, will likely cost us a lot more money in terms of having to transplant someone um we do have a number of, of candidates that have presented we're assessing their skill set many of them have tremendous experience in finance just don't have that experience within a k through 12 setting and what would that necessarily look like so a um, couple of candidates that we are, are looking at, but um, it continues to be challenging in terms of the in terms of the shortage. We also last month um, approved the um, uh, Mr. Juan Mosley as our assistant business manager. We explained the rationale behind why we needed that and the greater um, set of skills that that individual brings, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. King. Uh, kind of second that in terms of um, what have been playing both roles and as a business manager understands the role of um, being able to delegate a significant amount of, uh, of, of of items to that individual who's able to help facilitate that. And I think that's one of the challenges we saw and why we reconfigured uh, the, the department. You'll see a little bit of that um, later on in the, in the slide. Um, we continue to have uh, our account payable um, is on uh, is on leave. That individual is coming back, but we do have a current employee who is providing assistance with that. We have um, additional assistance from Robert Hasnett, who's a payroll uh, specialist, and Delaware County um, Intermediate Unit continues to provide assistance to um, uh, to the department. But it's not. Um, it does not have the really adequate amount of injury that we would ultimately would like, but we're getting as much support. And uh, believe it or not, um, this gentleman sitting to my right did have hair before he started um, two months um, before he started two months ago. Um, yeah, he used to stick too. Now I could not let him sleep. Um, so we continue to have um, those uh, those challenges. Um, um, then I wanted to. Uh, move to uh, where we are with regards to our budget. If I can take you back in February uh, when uh, Ms. Martin was here and we presented to you what we felt were some key items that were built, uh, were going to be built into the budget. And what you're seeing right now is um, a snapshot of that presentation. I've included the link for community members who want to go back to that February 22nd meeting where we talked about 
what we anticipated and what we built with the budget was a projected increase of 4.1, um, or at least no higher than 4.1. Um, we talked about some of the things we've done with going back to the departments, asking them to reduce their original uh, requests. Um, we talked about the budget being built with some high priority uh, positions and ending with some uh, extra funds. Well, fast forward, and there really has not been a significant amount of changes based on some of those asks. So what you're seeing right now is what currently um, has uh, also was applied to the budget. So when we talk about priority position, we shared with the board that in order to address specifically the first four position as it relates to finding within our audience, um, without beating this to death, um, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, the length of time that those numbers speak for themselves that A, um, we need additional supports in literacy and math with regards to intervention. Um, and part of that is to address um, how do we support children before we have longstanding challenges, right? Um, then we know that we need additional support for our English language learners, and we needed uh, an EL teacher uh, to support that, that program. We also committed to um, a school counselor, which we shared that would be at the middle school to provide that additional uh, assistance. And we also talked about the need for a math specialist. Um, our, um, we are not where we would like to be. We believe we need um, additional assistance um, to provide some really specific targeted. This math specialist and literacy specialist that you are seeing that's built into this budget. I want to tell you that we've already anticipated, though you have to approve this one, talking about what does that look like in terms of additional supports for other buildings uh, as well. If you want to eliminate this gap, you have to stop it from starting in the first place. And if you allow third and fourth and fifth grade children to transition with gaps in their learning, statistically, nationally, those gaps exponentially increase and become that much more difficult in order to, to do that. Um, um, but it also requires a, a different set of um, differentiation as well. So it's not just hmm, put more people in, right? It's not the only answer, but we do believe that we, we need uh, more support. Our teachers um, need more support that they're able to have push in and pull out uh, for, their, uh, for their students. Um, what we also wanted to share was that was not in that February meeting was really the way in which we spoke about the assistant business manager. And what we tried to do um, is our uh, accounting supervisor position, we changed and made that into a business um, assistant business manager. We felt like, the, like I said before, the breadth and depth of experience that we wanted to have, we needed to make that transition. The next position, um, and I'm reluctant to say new position, but I have to use that term. Um, um, but it is um, moving away from what was already budgeted as a third party service. So we had third party vendors who were providing behavioral health counseling to our students. Um, we spoke about this at the board that we wanted to look at the possibility of is it cost effective? Is it better in terms of service to begin transitioning? some of our third-party vendor to in-house. In this particular case, um, with student services, we felt that that was a really good move. And taking that budget line item that was already expended for and moving it uh, to a permanent position that is a WSEA a member versus a third-party uh, vendor. So we're just shifting really line items around. It's not uh, new money um, with, respects to, with respects to that. Um, then, we wanted to focus on the way in which we built the budget, the way we've been building the budget, is a commitment to what does year one implementation look like for a strategic plan? Um, and some of those unknowns. We did know that there were particular focus areas. So um, uh, budget managers were really mindful about, well, we don't know what um, 
intentionally STEM going to look like, but we know we need to improve the opportunities and the experiences. Very similar to Project Lead the Way and some of the ways in which Mr. Benting was talking about that. Some of the initiatives that will come out of uh, teaching, learning, and, and innovation. Some of the professional um, honing down on um, what teachers have talked about, which is, um, and um, staff members um, shared with me, listen, we want to be very clear. It's not necessarily more PD. It is about more targeted and specific, more aligned based PD so that when I spend four and a half hours, um, like yesterday, I want to make sure I walk away and those experiences I can transfer immediately into my, uh, into my classroom. For many of us who've been at conferences, um, there's nothing worse than waking up, going to a conference, and you sit there for five and a half hours and you wonder, um, I would never get those five hours back. And what am I supposed to do with this information I just received? Um, we don't want that to happen, which is why um, we're committed and we're responsive and want to listen to as much as we can in terms of uh, adapting the way in which we're providing uh, professional learning. Um, but we did think about the, um, the budget in terms of how does this support some strategic initiatives? What you will see differently in the next budget bill, very similar to um, what ELA Sports talked about, is the identification of a very specific line item that does say strategic plan. Um, very similar to other requests for specific line items in terms of capital improvement, they say we're going to do that. And we didn't create that this year. We, it was embedded in the way in which they created those budgets. Um, what we want to do for the next budget cycle is say to the board, um, saying, here's our operating budget. Here's dollars that are specifically connected to strategic plan. So anything related to implementation of strategic plan is going to be drawn from so those particular, um, those particular lines. I think it's going to be more helpful for you to see that versus trying to say, well, I have this $160,000 comprehensive budget, where is strategic plan? Where is oh, it's woven in there because it's the work we do every single day. It's like, well, where's the literacy initiative? We're like, well, literacy is what we do every single day. But because this is so targeted, I do believe that we need to have a separate line item as we think about the next budget cycle um, so that we can share um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. This initiative was specifically tied to that, and here's the dollar amount that we are investing or like to invest. When we say wellness, social, emotional competency, we're gonna, we've always been doing that work, but because we want to double down, we're gonna say, here's a specific line item, uh, and money's gonna be drawn from that to, um, to support that. So that's really what has helped to create, um, uh, create the budget. Um, and at, at this time, I'm gonna uh, pass the next two slides to Mr. King, who's gonna walk us through, um, uh, the proposed final budget and some other numbers as well. And then after that, um, Dr. Grande, I will pass over to you for um, for questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, okay. You've seen this slide before, but let's just go through the first couple of columns where the 21 22 actual, where we landed up, um, as to the audit, and then the 22 23 budget is the second column. We're going to use that budget, the 22-23 budget column, to compare where we are with the with the uh, proposed final budget, which is the third column. This is the summary of revenues and expenditures in this column for the, for the proposed final budget. Next column is the budget to budget to budget to yeah, budget to budget variance dollars. And then the following column, column is the percentage. Um, the next the next couple of columns is are what was presented in February uh, for the projected budget, the budget to budget, and then the variance, and then the final column is the difference between where we are now and where we were then. Um, so sticking with some of those variances, looking at the the local revenues, uh, the budget of budget is up about three point two million. Primarily, that's the tax increase of the 1.4 million. There's also additional 
interest that was budgeted to, to reflect more of what was being earned this year. So that, that was up also. So that those two items account for the, the majority of that 8.2 million that we see in the town. The state revenues budget the budget are up 1.3. We were uh, we received a pretty nice increase in the basic education uh, funding as well as the special special ed funding uh, this year. So that is primarily what's reflected in the uh, state line there, that 1.3 million, 1.2 million. Plus the budget, it went up about 854,000 and. Spec Ed went up about 320,000. Uh, I'm sorry, the BGF went about that. That's a budget to budget. The actual was a little bit less than that. The, the, I don't know, the budget was, um, the budget amount in that column was a little low. But when I looked at the governor's budget and compared it to what we will actually receive for 2223, mm -hmm. so you, you, you budget these subsidies, but they continue to change. As the as the data points come in over the over the current year, you can get more or less depending on those. Um, so we're actually getting a little bit more, but the estimated that they're going to send us for the for the basic ed funding compared to what is proposed in the 23-24 is about a 9.3 percent increase. Department of Ed as a total, all all districts, everything. That line item went up about 10.5%. So we did all right with the increase. We got a, we had a good share of that. We had an equal share of the BDF increase. <clears throat> Special education, based on what they're saying, the revised estimate for 22-23, and what they have communicated is going to be our allocation for 23-24. That's an increase of about 8.2%. 8 .2%. It's a little higher than the overall budget, which increased about 7.8% for all districts. So we're, we're doing pretty good with, with some of the changes that the governor has made. Um, there's also another initiative that's in this budget, um, the school-based mental health. That was, that's new money being proposed uh, by the governor, and that's about 140,000, so that's so the, the actual dollar amount estimate to our proposed goes up about seven hundred thousand. So the first line that you see here, you see you see the line item. That was because the BEF budgeted last year was lower than expected. So a budget to budget comparison is going to be different than when I compare what we're actually going to receive this year. To what we're proposed to receive based on the governor's budget. The, the next line, uh, revenue line item down is the federal sources. That's coming down about 700,000. That's primarily due to the ESSER estimate. You see in that second column, you see that 1.5 million. Um, I reduced it and, and so did Mary for, at the February presentation to, to reflect a little bit more of an accurate number that we were going to receive um, based on the spending pattern and what um, we have received thus far. So all in all, when you take all those considerations, revenue is going up about 4.2% in total. Moving down to, oh, okay. So the, the, the farthest, so you can see the differences of where we were um, in February and where we are now. The local revenues have increased about 186,000. Um, February, February had estimates for BDF and uh, spec ed, but now these are more firm, these numbers. We actually have those from, from P&E. Um, the, the state sources, again, I'm sorry, that's the state sources run about 400,000. The local revenues are close, about 186. That was just a lot of just looking at, looking at what was budgeted, looking at spend trends or, or receipts trends and kind of looking at different things. Some of these aren't hardcore numbers. For example, if you budget delinquent taxes, well, we had a banner year in one year. 
I look back and we had like eight hundred thousand dollars of revenue. Then it drops off because I guess I really paid the taxes that year. Mm -hmm. And then the following year, there wasn't so much going to tax. So that, that's a kind of a slippery number. So, but just kind of looking at those things, all different line items up, up five, down 10, all these different little line items um, on the local side, that, that accounted for about $186,000 change between February and now. Up, 186000 up. And the state sources went up about $400,000 primarily because we have the final numbers and the increases that I had indicated before were, I was really surprised by it, actually, really keen them go up that high from year to year. Uh, so that reflects some of the change that occurred from February to the state and February to the proposed budget that is in front of you now. And then, of course, we're actually, we didn't, we're pretty close from February to today, about 32,000. Um, so there wasn't a lot of change, but most of it was just getting more accurate and up to date information about what we can expect for the 23 24 budget. Moving down to the expenditures, we delineated it between the school district budgets, personnel, and uh, personnel benefits. We also put the line item separately to show you um, the new position cost that Dr. Marcel has spoken about previously. So when we look at the school budgets right now in 26407 to the last year's budget, they're up about 766,000, about 3%. A lot of that has to do with some of the initiatives um, that were also addressed uh, by Dr. Marcel. Um, personnel salaries are moving at 2.2, about 5.6 percent. That that's primarily just adhering to the current CBAs that are in place now, making sure and moving and following those uh, salary schedules and whatever all the different requirements within um, those contracts and agreements. Benefits are up about 245,000, a little less than 1%. Seems bad, right? The salary going up. Well, we actually, the, the medical, the second look for medical insurance went down 3%. The, for prescription, it was flat at 0%. So, so that's kind of reflected in there. Um, if you look in that far column, the 296, some of those things we didn't know in February. We didn't know what the second month was going to be. Are you familiar with this, this terminology, the first look and the second one? Okay. Maybe um, just explain it. Okay. Um, we have a consultant, Gallagher. Um, they do, they come out with an early estimate. They call it the first look. They come out. It comes out earlier in the year in the budget process. And it's prim primarily based on forecasting and, and, and things like that. Um, then, as we get closer and closer to the budget, will come out of the second book that has more up to date uh, information at that time. So, this final second look of our cost is down 3%. And I said the prescription was also flat. So we did, so that's why you don't see that big jump in benefits. Then the new positions, this is all in net. This these, that number that 703,000 is salary and benefit cost. That's the total cost for those six new positions. Again, when we go when we move when we move across to what was presented in February. The school department budgets actually came down about 628,000, 630,000 in February. Um, there was a lot of looking at those. Some of that involves um, removing what was previously contracted, removing it to the salary. So that, that dropped the money. That, that, um, there's also some other little tweaking that, that we did on some of those budgets that the departments and the heads and, and Dr. Monte has done. With some of their budgets. So again, this is the budget budget. Um, or budget proposed final budget for the budget that we had in February. 
the salaries again aren't that different but there's a little bit more in the proposed budget there's another salary there's um some changes just the salaries that represent about a third three hundred thousand dollar increase from what we saw in february to what we've seen today and then personnel benefits the budget the budget the difference between um February's and this one's is about 815,000. That's because that was an early look. Certain assumptions were made about how benefits were going to flow. I think probably, I think it was a 4% increase, and we went 3% the other one. So we were going to see some differences there. Um, <clears throat> also, there is a uh, projected deficit. Previously, when budgets were presented, any kind of um, drawdown of fund balance was included in revenue as a line item. So that, and then the total revenue is your total expense. I pulled it back out because that's not the way we're going to, if, if we were to continue with this today, that's not how you do report it on the um, to the state. You actually show a deficit, and then it's explained that that's going to come out of fund balance at the end of the year. So that's a little different. That's that's the summary. Um, the next the next slide. So we can hold it safe. I went down. I went down and looked at each of the. Um, Overall cost centers, supplies, benefits, professional services, all the individual components um, taken together <laughs> to look at how they were moving and, and then identify what the significant drivers may be in each of those line items called in that region. So if we begin with the, with the employee salaries, they're going up two points, almost 2.7 million or 6.7 percent in total. Again, that has a lot to do with the new positions on the salary side and matching the, the, the current contracts and the salary and benefit agreements that are held with um, Act 23, all the individual groups. Mm -hmm. The benefits, um, budget to budget, going up about $500,000 or 1.9%. Again, that's reflected in the savings. Um, from the medical and the prescription, and um, also there's a, there's a number that's in there for the about two hundred fifty thousand for the new position. In the summary, I had those two numbers together, seven hundred and three thousand, for the sake of discussion, so that we can see what those salaries are are um, estimated to cost the district. In this one, they're they're back where they belong. Salaries are in the salary, benefits are in the benefits, so you might see a little difference there. The next line item down, we had hair, but also see better, <laughs> um, is the professional services going down about $360,000 from budget to budget. Um, that is part of, as Dr. Morse had said before, was pulling contracted dollars out of that line item, and that is now in the salary and benefits. So that's a little bit of a drop. So that was travels also, um, I think at that time, the safety security aides were budgeted to be contracted if they couldn't find people to hire. So we found those people to hire. So that's in salary and benefits that came out of this sunken line item. That, that was about a savings of about 185,000. Think that saved 185,000 came out of that line. Salary benefits are documented for the salary benefits. Purchase property services um, up about 567,000. There's lighter in the budget for um, lighting and audio equipment project at the high school. Mm -hmm. As well as we talked about lawn care, the previous uh, gentleman talked about lawn care. So we have a little bump in lawn care uh, in that. And also, it also reflects the uh, the recent uh, custodial agreement. Uh, it was previously budgeted just under under a million. I think the first year was was close to was over about one million sixty. 
I put in 1.1 million. Because I, mean, I need that for the discussions about seeing, seeing how there's any other additional costs for special cleanings or overtimes or things like that. So that, that number is going to be good. Um, in addition, I also tried, I also took a look at the uh, Giza. Uh, they have, they have, they have it, they have it out for each of the years of what the projected cost avoidance would be. Um, before I before I heard what Pete said today, I was looking at the schedule that they had sent, and I was trying to determine when they said how much you would save in the instrument installation year and how much you would save in each year thereafter, which is how they, they calculate their guarantee. So I was looking at something and I didn't really know exactly when the installation started. And I also wasn't sure it, it it's a tricky thing because you can save kilowatts but you don't necessarily save dollars if the if the rate goes up you're going to spend more money but with the giza it would have gone up much higher so it's kind of slippery and there's also uh rebates for pico in there. well i wasn't sure when we could expect those rebates. um at the conclusion of all of it or is it just on the um electric and natural gas. So I came up with a, four different ways of looking at it and ended up just putting in, ended up calculating about $70,000 70, savings in that way from the people. The next item down, this is the, the line item that has um, all your two, all your uh, out of district tuitions. It's uh, your special, special ed, uh, your food private schools, non pub and so on that is in this line item as well as um, your insurances so there's been a little uptick on that you know, i know the insurances went up so yeah, much but for the tuition and there's also some pd in here that went up a little bit um, so that accounts for the two hundred sixteen thousand dollars in this world supplies and benefits Books, utilities, as it lists there, software, um, general supplies. Um, most of this increase of just under 300,000 is basically in the general supplies and then the tech supplies. We also have an increased purchase, an increase in the purchase of books, about 130,000. And the tech supplies were up, tax and general supplies were up about 50,000. Um, it doesn't necessarily reflect additional utilization or additional consumption that has a lot to do with that. Um, moving down to the furniture and equipment, this is where you're going to find some of the STEM initiatives. The we have uh, money in the budget to to purchase the necessary um, furniture and equipment to to renovate, not renovate, but to utilize that existing room for a STEM room as opposed to an auto an automotive room. Mm -hmm. um, so that's 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 in this line item, as well as there's 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 a line item in there on the athletic side for purchasing um, wrestling mats, soccer goals, and oddly enough, a portable press box. I don't know what that is, and I don't know what it looks like. I'm going to find out. There's some money in it, as well as some other things. Is it? I don't. I don't know. Probably inflatable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that that accounts. Those items right there um, account for the three hundred thirty-three thousand dollars, or most of the three hundred thousand. These are the significant drivers in the category. Other objects. This is your, this is interest and your it's dues and fees and interest on your debt. That has, that's going up a little bit. The other objects, 106,000, that's, that's for the bond issue. Also in this group is the educational support agreements are in this line item. Um, so there's been a slight little uptick regarding that 
bond interest is kind of flat, but it went up a little bit. And then some some additional costs for um, memberships to various organizations that a lot of principals and instructional staff uh, belong to. And um, those conferences that they attend. The final is where the where you'll see uh, it went down. There's in this land. Main reason it went down is because in this year we have a three hundred twenty five thousand dollar transfer to the capital reserve in the uh, in the twenty two twenty three year. This budget did not have that. It didn't include a transfer. I wasn't sure. Where we were going to move, I wanted to see where we were going to end up. We were looking for the 4.1. So I didn't include it in this version. So, all in all, we went up about 4.3% on the expenditure side. And I want to just reiterate that this is a proposed final budget. We're not done. We're not done yet. We, we will have something. We're going to take a look more look at it. There's more poking that I have to do and look at the lands and trendings and all this kind of stuff um, to arrive at the final final budget that will be presented in June. And then if you go down further, you'll see in that one line it says excess or deficit. You'll see that negative hundred thousand. But the fund balance, you can see in that fund balance that we ended up with a with a uh, um, excess in 21-22. And you can see down further, you can see how that fund balance is moving. We started with the, the seven, the 7.7 7 mil, and then we had the, the, the uh, excess. So that went up. Final, in, the, in the final budget, it's it's neutral. There's no effect on fund balance in 22-23, but for the proposed 23-24, you see the 100,000 raw down. I'm just going to show you how the fund balance is with it. That is a complicated, multi-line budget in the current Okay, and then we'll open up questions. I'm just, I'm just digesting all this. I, I, I can get right now. Quick, quick question. Uh, our projected surplus, it was one, one million sixty-seven thousand five hundred ninety-eight on the one page, but then it's slightly different on the next page. It's one thousand. It's very close. I was just curious about why it would be a different number. It's four. It's slightly. It's slightly. It is slightly. I mean, slightly, it's slightly only. Up. But I just curious. Aren't when you get a report yeah. down, aren't they supposed to be exactly? Yeah, they should be. Okay. I agree. Yep. Yeah. If you if you look at that, it's the four. So you said it's the four. That, is that the number of the different five ninety eight? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So seven right. versus four. That's a huge joke there. Is it? You think? Yeah. Fine. Yeah. I, I just noticed that. Remember, it's the only yeah. question I had. Yeah. Very yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, no. Um, just a couple of comments, uh, more than anything else. Um, actually, first question. Um, next year's budget, SR funds, any left, or the, this was the final year of budget, the current budget? I think this might be the final year. I, I'm not entirely sure. I got to be on the floor. Yes, the end of the that's it. It's over in June. Yes, yeah. Okay. In 2024. So next yeah. budget year does yeah. have yeah. some yeah. Esther funds. Yes, because, yes, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, I wouldn't expect yeah. you to have it now, but if you could follow up and just let us know how much Esther dollars is represented on the revenue side for federal sources. Uh, that would be helpful to study that in your just in terms of long range planning. Um, that is true, but some of the, the ESSER dollars that is allowed to be utilized in the expenditure of the right revenue. And then uh, just a couple comments. Um, one is 
I know Dr. Marseille already has this in mind, but I just want to say that as, as we begin to make some of these educational investments, um, I know it's a priority for you to come up with outcome measures, performance measures for these types of investments so that we can begin to see what's working and what's not working and be able to reposition dollars when we're not seeing the outcomes that we want. Yeah, if I can respond, I think um, in some of the community conversations, um, I, I think uh, for a couple of members I've been interacting with, there's this um, disconnect in terms of when we when we use cost benefit analysis in a school system, people tend to think, well, how would you why would you use that term when talking about children? Um, well, um, when you're preparing a budget, uh, the reality is you are proposing particular outcomes, mm -hmm. and you have a program that says this program is supposed to do A, B, C, or D. We're investing X amount to do that. Um, it's not that we want to get rid of programs, but we need to find a way to evaluate their effectiveness. And there are times where programs run because that's the way the system operates. But yet, when you say, what was the key performance indicator that would measure um, the success of the program, right? Um, and there's lots of stuff. Students feel really happy and connected. That's great. Um, but there's also these hard academic outcomes to say, if I'm going to invest um, $100,000 in an intervention model to help um, reduce the gap or increase um, student reading proficiency, you want to be able to say, well, over the course of a year, year two and year three, is that investment paying off based on what we are wanting to do? And if it's not, it's not, I think people feel like, oh, it's not working cut. Right. <laughs> it is a reassessment and a reimagining of whether or not um, we are bearing the fruit that we're looking for. So I've learned that maybe in the audits, um, when it said cause benefit analysis, I think it rubs individuals the wrong way as they think about children. But I do think that if you're going to invest in um, a particular programming, you want to be able to come back to the board and say, um, with enough time to collect the data, here's what we believe we're receiving, and do we need to um, recalibrate? And that recalibrate could mean um, a reallocation, not necessarily eliminating the program or doing something very differently. Uh, I've been in school districts where, and I gave this example at the uh, at the community, I said, well, in a particular community, they set aside two hundred fifty thousand dollars for an after-school intervention program. It's a lot of money for an after-school intervention program. Uh, it's been running for five, six years. There was no data to support that intervention was working, but everyone wanted the program. So you have to find ways to analyze, and we're gonna try to see how we can be more effective um, with the limited dollars that we do. And I understand some of these interventions are not like snap your fingers and expect no. to see big outcome changes, mm -hmm. but having some way to get a sense if you're moving in the direction yeah. of what we're aiming to yeah. see over the course of uh, multiple years. And then the only other comment I have is, it, you know, if there if there's a way to find room for capital fund contribution in the final yeah. budget, um, <laughs> I don't expect you to answer that today, but obviously, uh, well, you know, we, again, I want to think about our capital investments as um, the big, the, the big things that we're talking about, additions to buildings and things of that scale, I know we'll have to go out and, and borrow mm -hmm. money and take on new debt to finance those projects over mm -hmm. years. Um, but, you know, we'll take King Field as an example, that project is very appropriate to finance through the capital fund, and we should be able to support those types of capital fund investments out of the capital fund. So. Or a new roof, you know, all those kinds of yeah. things that are costly, you know, yeah. put your maintenance to one time deals. But... Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone else from the committee have anything before we move on that one? Uh, Annette, do you have anything? Kelly? I'm just uh, to check my map, and, and I'm going to put you on the spot, and if, you, if you're not ready to answer it here, that's fine. But when I, I'm just looking at the the increase 
budget to budget of the three, I can't see that, 3.95 or so, um, right, 3.95. Are you referencing when you live money and you're looking at the summary? Budget, budget to budget. To, sorry, I'm on. I'm trying this one. Uh, this one's put up. No. no. Not that one. No. Um, the one by object. That yeah. one. Yeah. Thank one you, Larry. Okay. By object. Okay. So uh, 3.95 or so million um, budget to budget difference in whole dollars. Mm -hmm. And when I look at that, it what I'm seeing is just a little under 81% of that whole dollar amount is employee salaries and benefits alone. Um, and I think it's important to understand that because at the end of the day, what I'm seeing is where it leaves us with, uh, I think 700, or did I write it? $767,000 to fund everything else. So when we think about, you know, where, how our dollars are moving around, um, it, it's, to me, it's really important to, to understand that we're still pretty overall constrained in how much is available to use for all of these other purposes. Um, and, and, and Dr. Grande, you, you made the, the point earlier about some of the ESSER funding that is still in here that won't be in here in out years. And as a board, I think we have to think very, very carefully about that as we move forward. Um, how we're going to make up for for the loss of the other funds and so forth. So I'm not. It's not a. Just wanted to make sure that my math was right on it. I was a, a, a language arts person for sure, <laughs> but I think it's it's something that we all need to really keep in mind. But specifically, are seventy seven percent salary and benefits to be business. So yeah. um, we may be a little bit higher, moving a little bit higher now with the influx of the. Exactly, which we talked about as being um, essentially budget neutral for us because we're moving them from one line into another. Um, I definitely appreciate that, but I'm just, it's its kind of constructive when you look at it that way. That's all. I can't see it. Oh, yes. I, just, I, I just put a great big yes with exclamation point on measurable outcomes for our expenditures. Thank you, Dr. Mercedes. This is really, uh, I really appreciate, especially as we look at our limited number of expenditures, just as you pointed out, that we are uh, looking at what's effective. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Um First of all, I second or third, uh, Dr. Marcel's trying to measure. Yeah, okay, sorry, you could introduce yourself again. Oh, uh, really? Okay, so my name is Leo. Nine Sykes Lane. I just wanted to say I support you trying to measure the outcomes, but also I support your point that you can't do it. Sometimes there has to be way out there. Um, I hear the mention of gap here, and I'm not sure I know what that is. I assume it's the difference between where we are and where is it where we want to be or where somebody else is or and, and is the gap getting wider or are we lessen the gap again to your point of trying to measure things. But what is where what's the gap mean? Thank you for that comment and stuff we were going to very Morris Lane. I have a number of questions. I don't know if you wanted to answer that one first. And then see. Go ahead and, and uh, it's a list. Okay. Just, okay. Um, I was just uh, just because I like doing the math myself. Um, I was wondering how many dollars are raised for every one percent of tax increase. That's a simple. Um, calculation. Um, do we have the uh, the year end projections for the expenditures? And if we do, are we on the plus side or minus side? Basically, um, some of these some of these have been answered, so I'm going through through my notes here. Um, how has the proposed budget been affected and on top of salaries, pensions, and medical premiums um, by the teachers that have decided to, to retire? And I think we are up to seven now. So, um, so far, as of 
today. And is it the intent of administration to um, replace all those retirees? Um, because if, if if we aren't, obviously we should save money and salaries, pension, medical, for that. Um, I wanted to double check. I think I saw the number, but there's a lot of numbers up there. Those new positions, assistant business manager, literacy and reading teacher, English language teacher, school counselor, math specialist, and six through 12 athletic and athletic activities director. Are we guesstimating that that $704,000 in total cost? That's okay. That's the first time I saw that number tonight. Um, I believe you said this, but I'm just re asking are we estimating that our utilities will be $70,000 less than we anticipated? Because I heard that number and I think it was based off of users. Um, questions, but it might have been on that sheet, and I hate to rehash it all out, but for existing employees, and I'm talking teacher support staff and F93 uh, administrators, I just wanted to know what the the total increase in salaries was <laughs> out there, but I'm, I'm not sure I could read it. And um, And one last thing, I'm surprised that the 4.1% proposed increase from back in December, uh, February isn't less strictly just based on the second look for the medical premiums where it's $569,000 less than what we thought it was on the first book. So I would think that if it's 600 grand less than what we put back in February, and it was 4.1% proposed in February, now it should be something less than 4.1%. Because at that time back in February, we were already saying we were gonna have these other positions created. So they should have been factored in. So. Why is the 4.1 still 4.1 when at least from a medical premium standpoint, we appear to be using less money? And I'll stop that. I think that's enough. For you. Thank you. Then, um, with the first question in terms of uh, of the gap, um, what we're specifically talking about is um, outcomes per student based on demographic groups. So we are seeing that particularly demographic group when it comes to uh, assessment outcomes on achievement are scoring far less than their peers. And uh, what we're trying to do, and this is not um, just a Wallenberg Swarthmore challenge, districts across the country are seeing disproportionality in outcomes, um, but we have to own that to our community. Um, what we want to address is what are meaningful research-based intervention that will help reduce that. When I said earlier that, um, and I remember this from um, another colleague and board member who would say that one of the most effective ways to eliminate the achievement gap or opportunity gap is to make sure it doesn't start. Um, because un unfortunately what happens is that it compounds over time. And if we can find where it really begins to rear its ugly head, and many debate on whether that has before um, schools in terms of what services are providing the families before they get into the school system. Others argue that once they're there, it's really around that third and fourth grade where we start seeing differences in outcomes. And I think those, uh, what we're trying to do is A, be more intentional with the type of interventions we're providing, that's extremely important. And then do we really, uh, do we need the additional staffing to provide that smaller group instruction? And I think we're addressing both of those at the, at the same time. So I think that's the conversation around gaps and outcomes in terms of performance of particular student groups. Is the gap narrow or is it widening? Um, 
Time will tell. What I do know is that we've had a persistent gap. Our audit we did last year shows that there's a persistent gap and that um, the gap builds over time. Starts at the third grade and it just progressively gets wider and wider. Not that it can't be reduced, just becomes that much more challenging in order to do that. Hence the reason why we, the board, wanted to put together a long-term plan. And I think the genesis of this conversation um, even though it's not an Ed Affairs meeting, is about long-term planning. Um, the previous communication we had with ELA Sports was long-term planning. This is about long-term planning in terms of those investment dollars. So we're um, attempting to put things into place with the support of our staff and community to reduce those uh, those gaps. Can you, can you tackle? Yeah, some and, and some of the, I know you might not have. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, there were a conversation about um, how many dollars uh, is raised by one percent of tax increase. Um, Roughly seven hundred thousand. Yeah. Um, and then there. Um, uh, the year in calculations. The year in calculations. We do. We have. I don't we think do. we have those. We do not. Yeah. Um, we we're talking about those, we do not have those. No. Um, we're hoping to have those. Um, do we and, think we'll have them by June? Because I think it's critical having that information. Well, we do too. We were talking about we do, we, we do uh, this. Because if we have things that aren't quite right in this current year budget, they're not going to be right next year, especially if we're leaving. We're underrunning budget items for the present year. We're unaware of it, and we may be unnecessarily adding tax increase to the upcoming year, not knowing what the real numbers are versus what we the budgeted numbers are. I think it's understandable. Um, and then there was conversation about what is the effect of the budget by teachers who retired. We had that report. I'm trying to find it. Um, we have, I have to show you, that number is higher. The retired, we calculated not just certificated yes. staff, we calculated all the retires, whether they were support staff or any other staff member. That number is 18. Of uh, staff members. Of I was kind of talking about the people that affect Pizza. Oh, so, well, we have heard that everybody. They, the support, the support staff, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, with specific, with specific the question about the seven um, uh, certificated staff mm -hmm. that are um, retiring, those positions, we look to find attritional saving. Those positions will be replaced. There was not an opportunity. To find attritional savings and say, do we, um, can we be cost effective and not need to replace that? And all of the um, uh, courses of study and everything else, like you need a fourth grade teacher, right? Um, you look at attritional savings at um, more so at the high school level in terms of are there sections that are running, are those sections reduced? Um, does that create an opportunity for um, uh, for that? But we're replacing all of those. Teachers who are who are retiring. Um, I'm sorry. And but but the follow on to that would be how it affected the budget. Oh. My assumption would be, and this is just an assumption, you're most likely not going to replace. I don't know. I could be wrong. A step sixteen person with another step sixteen person. It most likely will be a younger person, which means. We have a lower salary, a lower pieces, a lower DICA, lower everything. And how that was reflected in the budget and what assumptions were made on those replacements. Yeah, Mr. King, do you have? I do. I know you look at this. We did. Right I can't pull it up. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't you okay. go on to maybe the next we slide, and we'll see if, I have if uh, Dr. Marseille can find mm -hmm. it. But uh, Ooh, sorry, not I know, I'm looking for it. Just the other question is new positions, uh, 704,000. New positions, um, uh, the, um, the cost savings of $70,000 for the Giza 
at 93 well, increases and what does that look like so the new positions what was the how much was the new how much i work? think i saw seven, yeah it's, it's right? a, yeah yeah how is much that correct? correct did it's i read seven, that correctly yeah seven hundred and three thousand for the so new positions. yes whatever the yep. six positions or something like yeah. yeah and the utilities saving yeah. what's in the budget but the, the drop in the 70 for that was that was um the estimated cost avoidance due to the giza yeah. right and then which i need to take another look at because yeah. i heard today that it's 90 90 percent done so i'm going to take another look again and then for existing employees i think the question was around a total increase budgeted increase in salary for act 93 employees yeah. for act 93 only not the entire staff. Three different categories. Each. Okay. I, I, I do have those. I think we I do have them. You, you can get that to me. Like okay, we'll get that. We'll get that. Fine. Sorry. Sound touch me. Talking about fingerprints on the screen. Yeah, he's trying to touch the screen. I was like, "Where was that?" I'm sorry. Okay, okay, right. Okay, right. All right, Mark. Mark, he's doing that. There it is. Okay, okay. Don't touch my screen. He does not. You gotta get it. They do it down. I get to clean a screen like. Okay. All right. So the, the total cost of the retired, but the impact of the budget for all of the retirees, all 18 of them, is a reduction of $419,000. And to, to comment, it's not always, you don't always save money. Sometimes, sometimes the difference is. The person going out might have single benefits, and you haven't hired the person coming in yet. So I assume that I assume family. Well, I was talking salary. Salaries. Well, the sal. I I didn't look at salary. I didn't look at I didn't look at salary and benefits. This that number that four hundred sixteen thousand dollar number is for what is the savings for each of the first each of the people salary and benefits. I look at who's in there now, what that person costs, based on all the changes and, and the current um, agreements, current increases, the current changes in medical. This person is budgeted for a hundred thousand dollars. Now we're going to bring somebody in, maybe at a lower rate, but also with a hot with well at family, and then I that's the difference. Okay, so I did that for each one of them. So all eighteen of them. Uh, uh, add up to just over four hundred thousand savings. Yes, sir. Okay. And then the last one was about with uh, well, compared to February. Yeah. Compared to February for one percent with medical with medical. The assumption the was it would have been it would have been lower. The second look that the one point one would have dropped below four point one. Well, could have been, but some of the revenue was adjusted. Plus, that has. The actual cost of all six of the new positions. I don't know. I'm not sure what was in the other. It was wasn't at that number in February. Yeah, I mean, it was five. Five, five, five was even change. change. But I don't know what yeah. was in there or how it was calculated. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, with that, uh, just a number of items that are going to be presented to the board. Not all of them, but. We're going to be presenting uh, on the 22nd, and then um, our next meeting is June 21st. We'll to adjourn. All right. Thank you. Thank you.